Well, this morning, we are wrapping up uh, our nine-week series on the Holy Spirit, on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm being honest, um, I have to admit I'm a little sad about it. Like, this has been really good for me. I, I think it's been really good for us. I, I have enjoyed this, this uh, challenging and transformative focus on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in our time. And, and, and I would say that the, this series has allowed me, created room for me to confront some of my own misunderstandings or my wrong assumptions, or again, probably even at its core, sometimes some fear that I have about who the Holy Spirit is and how he works and what his objectives are in my life. And, and this has been um, a time to open my eyes, not only to the nature of his work, but also then allowing me to make the conscious step of partnering with him in it. And, and I've grown in that, and, and, and my own awareness of it is, is, is increasing, and I'm excited about that. But then it also occurred to me that as the church, we are, we're never done talking about, teaching on, and, and ultimately relying upon the Holy Spirit to do what Jesus sent him here to do, to, to be our advocate, to to shape us and to transform us into men and women who more closely resemble Jesus. So next week, when we begin our series on the book of James together, we are going to be no less dependent upon and no less attentive to the work of the Holy Spirit, recognizing and applying that which he wants to do through us and through the church in our lives, just like we've been seeking to do that now. And if you've been tracking with us throughout this, our, our stated objective in the midst of all of this series has been as the church to grow in our awareness of the Holy Spirit and to grow in our ability to live according to the Holy Spirit. And so what, what we mean by that is we wanted to, we wanted to be more cognizant um, and, and more increase our ability to recognize his work, identify his work in our lives so that we can respond to that, see what it is, and, and partner with him in that. And say, okay, I, 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 this is what the Holy Spirit's doing. I want to align myself with that work in my life. And the result of all of this is what Paul in Galatians chapter 5 is going to refer to as the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and that's what we're going to kind of wrap things up with the, this morning. My understanding of, of Paul's illustration about the fruit of the Spirit has increased somewhat over the last few years. Because when we talk about the idea of the fruit of something, we, we, we really mean what we're referring to is the, something is the result, right? This is the result of this thing. For instance, for me, a couple years ago, I turned 40 years old. And I am experiencing the result in some ways of turning 40. I, uh, I used to be able, and, and to no credit of my own, I used to be able to live a life where I could eat pretty much whatever I wanted at any time I wanted and live a relatively sedentary lifestyle and, and really never affect my overall physique. You know, like I could, I had this crazy metabolism and, and it just would burn calories to no end. And then I turned 40. And like, I just sort of assumed all my pants were simultaneously shrinking at the same time. Like I, I but all of a sudden, like I could not live this way anymore. And, and on top of that, I'm a bit of like a, a stress eater. Like when stress is, life is stressful, um, I eat. And so like, I've had daughters that have gone into high school. Like we, we opened up a new building, all these things. I've been eating a lot. And, and all of a sudden I realized like the, the way that I used to live is I can't live that anyway, and that's the fruit, that's the result of turning 40 years old. Like, I'm, I'm going through the change, as they say, you know? Like, I can't do things the way I used to do it. And so now what we discover here as we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit is that this is the result of the Holy Spirit's wor uh, work. Let me, let me, let's read this together. This is in Galatians chapter 5. This, this passage says, 
especially if you grew up in the church at all, is going to be very familiar to you because oftentimes this is one of those sets of verses that we memorize at a very early age. But listen to what Paul says here. He says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which we other translations say patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Now, how many of you, when I read those verses to you, began to make like a, a mental checklist of how you're doing? Anybody? Like when you hear the fruit of the Spirit, does it sort of intuitively, do you start to sort of say like, okay, like maybe I'm doing well in, in some of these areas and, and maybe I need to grow in some of these other areas or I could improve here. And, and as a matter of fact, I remember as, as a kid or a teenager, somebody sort of teaching the fruit of the Spirit. And we, we broke it down into categories between like strengths and average and weaknesses. And, and we looked at the weaknesses and said, okay, if I'm if I'm lacking in kindness or in self-control, then, then these are the things that I really need to work on. These are the things that I need to put my time, this is what needs to grow in me. And so the action step that's born out of that is, is we start thinking to ourselves, well, I, I, I need to be more self-controlled and I need to work on being kinder and I'm, I'm gonna produce these fruit in me. And, and in doing that mindset, we actually miss what Paul is saying here about the fruit of the Spirit and about what actually produces the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which in verse 16, he defines as walking by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. See, we, we want to look today at, at what Paul is teaching the church about the work of the Holy Spirit and by working through just a few, few observations that he makes about, about the nature of the fruit of the Spirit. So let's begin by considering why fruit matters. Why fruit matters. H how do you know that somebody has, has really changed? Like maybe if you've lived enough life, you've been in some sort of circumstance or situation where somebody has in your life said, I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to, I'm going to, but how do you know that that's real? How do you know that that's genuine? I mean, all of us, I would say that, that we feel confident in that reality when we see their life reflect that change. We see evidence. We, we, we see them operate differently. For instance, I, uh, several years ago, when I was a student ministry pastor, leading kids on one of our retreats. We had the, uh, a student who just had this really incredibly powerful encounter with the gospel of Jesus Christ, transformative weekend for them, and, and they come home and, and they're living their life and, and sort of sharing with their parents what had happened. But you could sort of sense there was this degree of skepticism that maybe they had kind of gone down this road before. But one year later, when we were packing up and loading up the bus to take that trip again, the parents said to me, he goes, you know, one year ago, when you brought back our kid, you brought back a different kid. Like that, this person that went on that trip, came back, had this experience with Jesus, came back, and now we've seen the evidence of a life that's been changed. The, the way that they interact with people, the way they treat us, the way that they um, are, are committed and the, they're following up with the disciplines. This is a different person. And we've seen it, we've seen it lived out, we've seen the evidence of this. See, when Jesus is describing this to his disciples in Matthew chapter 12, he says it this way, he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. So I don't know if... if Paul here in Galatians is intentionally drawing on Jesus' illustration, but he's ultimately after and making the same point. It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit that is the visible display. It's the fruit of the Spirit that's the evidence of transformation. So Paul begins to describe throughout this passage this, 
this before and after, this good fruit and, and bad fruit. If you look back in verse 16 of, of chapter 5, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's, there's sort of two sources that he identifies here. A good tree and a bad tree. See, Paul is going to talk a lot more, and we'll get into this in, in just a moment, as he contrasts and talks about the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and walking by the Spirit in, in contrast to acts of the flesh. But I want us to just take a moment to consider the significance of this. The significance of that question, why does, why does the fruit matter? It, it matters because this is the, these this fruit is the hallmark of a life that's been radically changed by Jesus. It matters because one of the most powerful proclamations that you and I can make of the gospel is a life that's defined and characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. This fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of the gospel's power in our life. On the flip side, the adverse of this is subsequently true as well. We, we can do so much damage, so much harm to our gospel witness when the fruit of the Spirit is absent in us. For example, have you, have you ever been around or known somebody who just is a Christian but is just miserable in life? They're just constantly cranky and, and nothing's ever good enough and they're always complaining and they're harsh to people. And, and when you're around that person, do you say to yourself, man, there's something about them that just draws me to them, right? There's something about them that, that makes me want to be like them. Of course not. That, that's not how we react when we're, we're around people like that. We, we, we actively seek to avoid them. Sometimes because we think that they, they are, we're going to catch whatever they have that's made them so cranky, you know? There's not a, 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 a force in that. It, it was sort of ironic this week as I was preparing this. Um, my air conditioning died, and, and I was tested on some of the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not even joking. I laid in my bed sweating, praying, like, joy, peace, you know, like, all, all these things, because it was, it was natural for me to sort of get really complaining. And then I sort of remembered, I live in like the one time in history, in one of the few places in the world, where it's sort of the expectation that we can condition our house against the weather. You know? Uh, Jesus and Paul are teaching us that the nature of the fruit reveals the nature of of what is at the core or the tree, this, the place as N.T. Wright describes it, where, where your true identity lies. Your, your deepest motivation comes from where the power that rules your life is found. If the fruit is good, it reveals that the tree is good. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Paul then goes on and starts to deal with this understanding then of how fruit grows. How does, how does fruit grow in our lives? And, and Paul's illustration here, by the way, of, of, of the fruit of the Spirit carries far more depth with it than, than I previously recognized. There's a lot more in this illustration that Paul is communicating than, than I think my eyes have been open to previously. How many of you here, just by show of hands, are into gardening at all? Like, have a garden? Okay, good. By the way, much greater representation than in Saturday night service. No gardeners out there last night. But if you are a gardener, you know how much work it requires. I, I, I don't have like a fruit and vegetable garden, but I do try to maintain my landscape um, and, and keep that somewhat like up to shape and, and my yard and that sort of thing. And um, my house backs up to this wooded area behind us. And there's like a creek back there, but it's, it's, it's just kind of largely this just overgrown um, like forest kind of behind my house. And it's full of things like honeysuckle and all of these evasive plants that constantly want to take over my yard. 
And it is, it is an active process to fight, to push that back and to preserve my sort of like well-defined beds. Um, and there's all these weeds and, and, and apparently there's like somewhere around one million rabbits that live <laughs> in this woods. I, I, I kid you not, I was back there trying to like get mulch down like a week or two ago and I'm just wheelbarrowing. It was like around dusk, so it was kind of getting towards evening. And like four or five rabbits just come running into my backyard and they're just playing. And I'm like just walking through with the wheelbarrow and they're running in circles, just having the best time ever, as if I'm not even there. Like they don't even care. It's like, we're just gonna eat whatever we're gonna eat and that's your problem, you know? Um, and if you, so we know from experience the amount of work, the pulling of the weeds, the cultivating of the soil, the fighting off the pests that it takes in order to to maintain a garden. You can't and you don't just show up and scatter seeds and expect productive growth. It, it doesn't work that way. But even for those of you that are gardeners, even if you do all of that, are you the one who is ultimately growing the plants? Are, are you the one who is producing the fruit? Not, no, not really. Because you and I can't control the sunlight, and, and we can't control the rain. We don't control the, the process of photosynthesis. We, we don't control the stages of germination. The actual growth process of those plants is beyond our control. And this is, this is Paul's point here. The fruit of the Spirit is a result of the work of the Spirit. So what he's saying to the church then, our role in this, verse 16, is to walk by the Spirit. Verse 25, to keep in step with the Spirit. What he's teaching us is the church is to create an environment that is conducive for the type of growth to occur. Sure, we could scatter some seeds and, and, and forget about it, and we may even walk out a few weeks later and, and find a tomato plant in the midst of all of it, but its yield is going to be small, and, and it's going to be surrounded by weeds. So Paul gives us this description of the fruit of the Spirit, but he does so in, in contrast to the acts of the flesh. I have this little diagram here that, that sort of helps me kind of wrap my heads around what Paul is saying here when he describes these two, what I'll call two sort of opposing operating systems, two sort of ways of doing things that, that govern and rule our lives. This is from... Galatians 5, uh, verse 17 and 18. Listen to what Paul says. He says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So Paul here is, is you can put that um, illustration back up, yeah. Paul here is, he's identifying the nature of the struggle. There is the flesh, this Greek word sarx, which is our, our condition prior to placing our faith in Jesus. This is our sin nature. It, it's the governing authority of our lives before, before we've put our faith in Jesus. And this is our default operating system, and it's in conflict with what the Spirit wants to produce in us. Some of what I like about what Paul says here is it, it helps me understand why after 30 years, 30 plus years of following Jesus, I still struggle with some of the things I did so many years ago. Like you guys have heard me talk about before how I, I know that one of the things I'm prone to is to put my identity in the, the acceptance of other people. So I will, I will, out of my own humanness, I will go after approval and, and finding my identity in, in human approval in my life. And sometimes when I make decisions out of that and I do stupid things and I get so frustrated with myself, how after 30 years of following Jesus am I still struggling with this? How has this not been out of my life? And Paul helps us understand this here because he's saying you're, you're defaulting back to your previous operating system, the old way of doing things, the, the sarks, the flesh. 
and you're trying to do things on your own. So Paul goes on then to describe what the acts of the flesh look like. Pick it back up now in verse 19. It says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sex- sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting when I read Paul's letter here. It, 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 there's certain parts of it that just sound so familiar. So, so Paul is, he describes what the acts of the flesh look like. He, he describes, if we would continue the, the metaphor here, the fruit of living with our sin nature in charge. And, and he sort of breaks it into a couple of, of categories here. He talks about Sexual immorality, this is that Greek word pornea. Any, any expression of, of sex in our lives that is outside of, of the boundaries that God's placed of a covenant relationship between a husband and a wife. So he's saying, you, you're taking this thing that I've created to be sacred and, 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 and so beautiful and you're using it as if it's not sacred. And then he talks about... Um, idolatry and witchcraft, this, the worship of false gods or this, this attempt to sort of manipulate God in order to appear to express your own power and in order to sort of draw worship to yourself. He talks about things like hatred and jealousy and discord and fits of rage and selfish ambition, all of these relational breakdowns happening amongst the people. And it all sounds so familiar. See, Paul, Paul is writing to you in a context that is completely different than our own. It's a completely different culture in a completely different part of the world and a completely different time in history. But it perfectly describes the reality that we live in, where we experience and suffer from relational breakdown all the time, where we worship these inferior and false gods, where, where we're offended if, if anyone were to suggest that that. God puts boundaries around our sex lives. We live worlds apart, but the issues remain the same because it's all fruit from a bad tree. So he he describes this, the nature of the flesh, the acts of the flesh, but now in contrast to that, look at what he says back in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace peace forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. So Paul now contrasts the the acts of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit, and in doing so, he, he describes for us the character of Jesus. He says it's about love, making the needs of others, the concerns of others ahead of ourselves, Joy, this delighting increasingly in God, and not just, not just the benefits of God, but God for God's sake, who he is. Peace, it's trusting God with our lives, not, not just the absence of conflict or trouble, forbearance or patience, the ability to endure and suffer wrongs, but maintain this eternal long-term perspective talks about kindness, being other-centered, demonstrating God's love and care for for other people and goodness, that that integrity of life, of heart, transparency, that that honesty in all circumstances. Faithfulness, this unwavering commitment to God. Gentleness, which is humility blended with compassion. Self-control, which, which is the spiritual discipline to resist the sinful nature, to give control of self to the Spirit, to allow Him to lead and guide. And this is what he says then, that the Spirit will grow in us as He works and moves to make you and I, men and women, who are more like Jesus. You see, we, we established this at the very outset, that you and I don't control how much of the Spirit you give. We, we all receive, when we place our faith in Jesus, the full dose of the Holy Spirit. He's in us. But what you and I control is how much of the Spirit gets us. How, how much of ourselves do we give over 
to the Spirit. So the question that Paul is, is, is challenging the church with here is which self, which nature, which environment are you cultivating? What is it that you are, are investing in in order for it to grow? The nature of, of self, of the acts of the flesh, the sarks? Or are you creating an environment that is conducive for the Holy Spirit's work in your life? And then this ultimately leads us to, I think, a really vital observation that Paul makes, and that is simply where fruit comes from. Where fruit comes from. What, what, what is the root? What are the origins of spiritual fruit in our lives? What, what is the tree that produces good fruit? I think Paul's clear here. It, it, it's the work of Jesus on the cross. It's the message of the gospel. Look again at, at the progression of Paul's logic throughout these verses. This is back in verse 16. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then in verse 18, he says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You're no longer ruled by this previous operating system. And then verse 24 and 25, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So live by the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul grounds all of this in the power of the gospel to transform us. For us to walk by the Spirit, for you and I to keep in step with the Spirit, we have to continually preach to ourselves, hear, receive the truth, the message of the gospel. We, we, we have to filter our thinking, our perspectives, the way we view the world around us through the truth and the message of the gospel. We, we, we have to lean in and total dependence on his grace and his forgiveness that's available to us in the gospel. This, this is how we cultivate a soil in our lives that, that is conducive to the growth of, of the fruit of the Spirit. To understand, to be aware of, to view life through the lens of the gospel and how it changes us. Paul, and, and I'll wrap up with this, Paul, just a few verses or a few chapters earlier, chapter two, he says it this way. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, through the old way, then Christ died for nothing. See, for you and I, for the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, it's about understanding, knowing, preaching, believing, thinking through the lens of the gospel. It creates a greenhouse effect in our souls where the Holy Spirit transforms us to more closely resemble the person of Jesus Christ. And my heart and my prayer is that would be increasingly true in me. That that would be increasingly true in us. Because when that is the case, as that is the case, I believe that people will see that and that they will be drawn to it. There'll be something about that work in our lives that will be distinctive. And they'll say, tell me more. I want to know more. Why are you that way? Let's pray together and Eric will come up and close us. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this opportunity just to continue to talk about and look at the work of the Spirit in our lives, Lord. And it, we're wrapping up a series, but Lord, we do not want to wrap up our focus and our attentiveness on who you are and, and how you lead and guide. And so, God, we pray and we ask that you would create an environment in our hearts as we preach the gospel to each other, as we hear the gospel, as we think in light of the gospel, as, as we um, hold on to the gospel for grace and forgiveness, that you would produce soil in us that is healthy, that is conducive, that is, is a greenhouse for your growth. Make us more like Jesus. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. We're going to close today by singing the Lord's Prayer. So would you stand with us as we sing together? Mm -hmm.
This morning as you leave, um, as is our tradition on the first Sunday of the month, our, our uh, ushers will be available. If you would like to contribute this morning to our benevolent offering, we invite you to do that. This is a, a way as a church that we help meet the needs of those both in our church and in our community as they come in. And um, if you would like to contribute to that, they'll be available for that. As well as our prayer team, each and every Sunday is available here. If there's anything in in your heart, your life, that we can join alongside of you, pray with you. We uh, invite you to come uh, this morning to, to receive prayer. And now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, whose spirit is at work to produce in us, to shape us, to be men and women in the image of Jesus. May we be, may we be ready for his work. Do that here, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.